ain't no saint. Hey, there's levels to this thing. I'ma work, work, work till I get to see my king. Feeling like I'm James, like I bought a winner ring. <laughs> Man. We got the same matches, we at different levels. I'ma have to find a way to push the pedal. But my Christian race, I get the gold medal. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the First Love TV show. I'm Andrea, and I'm with Marion, Francisca, and Jeremy. Last week, we looked at reasons why people have one foot in the door and one foot outside of the door. And we also looked at reasons why people are not grounded in Christ or people aren't established in Christ. And this week, we're going to be looking at reasons why, additional reasons why people are not grounded or established in Christ. And so, Jeremy, I want to hear from you. Why are people not fruitful or why are people unable to grow in the things of God? Well, I think one reason why that is is that um, people can be privately weak or publicly strong. And what I mean by that is, like, I think it's best characterized by the verse in Luke 8, 17, which says, whatever you do the secret will be made manifest. And mm. um, basically that, what that means is that your secret life is more, impor is more important than your public. And a lot of times when we get to church, we have a, a picture that we give to other people, like, oh, like, I'm publicly doing well. Um, in the public, you're smiling, you're happy. Um, you're writing notes, you got your iPad, <laughs> like, you got everything right, you're, you're saying amen, you're jumping up and receiving it. But in your private life, your life is very different. And that's where that dual thing, like the dual thing that we're talking about comes in. It's like your private life, you're, you're succumbing to the same sins, you're living a completely different lifestyle that you show when you're among the regular church circles. And basically what that's saying is like that, will le whatever you sow, like you reap, like the fruits of what you do in the secret will always come out. Like there's no way that you can have a seek a different life in the private and not expect it to show in the public. That's what we're saying. And I think like with your verse, um, at times people get so afraid. They're like, okay, so God is just looking to condemn you or he's looking for like a mistake to like oust me. But it's not necessarily that like God is trying to oust you or condemn you because God is a God of love. He forgives us for our sins, our mistakes. The Bible says that he even um, throws it, our sins into the water. He forgets them and he moves on from them. But one of the things that you said towards the end, it's the fruits of um, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the things that we're doing in secret it's the fruits that come out after time. So it's not necessarily that God is shaming you or God is trying to condemn you, but it's the fruits that result and that's what is being brought to light. And an example of someone who was publicly strong and privately weak is mm -hmm. Samson in the Bible. I mean, Samson was literally like physically strong. Like everyone yeah. knew him as someone who was invincible. I mean, he could kill animals with his bare hands. He killed yeah. like a thousand people with his bare <laughs> hands. Like he was known as someone who was strong and indestructible. But in his private life where nobody could see him, you can see that he actually had a weakness for, an, for a woman who was who he was unequally yoked with, even like going back to what we were talking about. And ultimately, that woman led to his downfall. And we can see that he was not able to overcome his own desires and lusts. And as a result, yeah. he ended up falling into the trap of the woman, Delilah. And ultimately, it led to his downfall. You do when you're struggling, like in the secret, though. Because I know, like, a lot of times, like, we come to that place as Christians, right? Where it's like, you, you know you're struggling with something yeah. in the secret. Yeah. You know, like, you're going through that hard place, but you still have to keep coming to church and smiling to people, right? And you still have to keep coming to church and act like everything's okay, but you know, like, you're not living the good, like, a good private life. So, I mean, like, I don't know if, like, anyone's been there before, but I know I have. Like, I mean, <laughs> like, definitely, like, you're not, you're not even doing your quiet time. Like, your prayer life is, like, way low. And it, and it depends on, like, what you define as struggling, because some people, it could go, like, even, like, yeah. worse than that. So, like, what would you guys, like, do in, like, times of, like, that trouble? Well, I think that one of the deceptions the enemy tells us is that, like, oh, you can't go to anybody again mm -hmm. because it's like, oh, the people will be like, wow, we saw you smiling this whole time, but really you were struggling with this. Yeah. And it's kind of like, wow, I'm going to have to expose myself and they might look at me different and things like that. But the Bible says in, like, John 8, 44, that the devil is the father of all lies. So he'll want you to continue living that lifestyle where you're lying to you, the people that you see on the outside when you're really actually struggling. And that's where he wants to keep you in like a place of like just um, being alone and having to deal with that burden yourself. But I think whenever you're able to like just overcome that fear of being vulnerable or being exposed, you can actually get the healing that you need or like the freedom that you need. 
by reaching out. And the Bible says, like, confess your faults one to another. So um, if you're struggling with something, the only way you're able to get help is that when you confess that you have a problem. And then people are able to help you and people are able to show you the way to go. But if you try to cover, if you try to ignore the fact that you have a problem, you're unable to grow in the things of God. You're even unable to even have a deep or a type of a certain relationship with God because it's like you're covering some of the sins and weaknesses that is causing you to be, like, separated from God. And, Andrea, the end of that, verse also says so you shall be healed so there's a sense of healing that comes with being able to talk to people about what you're going through or what you're struggling with and also I feel like a burden is lifted out of you because you know sometimes when you're holding so much in you're not able to probably even function or react to certain things the way you're mm -hmm. supposed to but when you're able to talk to someone about it you feel like now that burden is kind of on them now like you're more <laughs> free and you're lighter in a sense so. I think the devil likes darkness a lot mm -hmm. and he likes keeping us in darkness he likes keeping the things that we do in darkness he likes making it a secret problem but the thing is that when light shines in the darkness darkness can't stand mm -hmm. so like once you begin mm -hmm. to open up your life then I feel like there's a certain power of that thing that you're struggling with, it leaves because yeah. the darkness can't stand anymore. Yeah. The more you expose it, you feel like, oh, no, 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 I can't do this. Like, yeah. this, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. But that's exactly what the enemy doesn't want you to do. He doesn't want you to open up and let people know, like, okay, I'm struggling with this. But once that light shines, those spirits and those things that seem to, like, hold you down and, like, chain you down, they leave, like they can't stand anymore. And all of a sudden, like Francisco was saying, that light feeling is more than just like a feeling, it's, it's a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. And God literally like, that's why he says like, take my yoke upon you, like, yeah. like let me take the burdens that you have. Like, and like all, all, that la all that labor, I'll give you rest. Like he, God gives us rest. In Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, that's what the verse says. And he gives us rest. And when we just turn to the Lord, whether that means turning to your pastor or turning to someone who can give you that input and say that I'm, that this is what I'm doing in my private life. It's not matching up with what I'm doing in the public. I need help. And all of a sudden, I think that's a way that you can overcome. Yeah, and I think it's important. Like, I like how you said that, whether it be a pastor or something. Like like we said before, it's not everyone necessarily that you need to go tell your whole problems mm -hmm. to. But again, using that discretion. And like the Bible says that God will give us men after his own heart. And I believe like our pastors and like leaders in our church are those people who basically can help us with that burden. So again, using that discretion, not telling somebody who's struggling with the same thing, hey, I'm struggling mm -hmm. with this, because that's not gonna help you. It may make you feel like, oh, at least I told somebody. Mm -hmm. But you need to go to somebody who can actually help you out of the place that you're in. So uh, yeah, I think that's just an important point to and make. And even speaking of how the um, devil likes to keep us um, in secrecy and keeps us in the dark, sometimes he will um, try to gripple you with fear that, you know, don't tell anybody because once you tell somebody, they'll now judge you, they will now condemn you. How will you even be able to look at people and um, how will you be able to look at people when you go to church? So sometimes he tries to keep you in fear. He tries to even deceive you that, you know, just keep your problem to yourself. It's okay, you can deal with it. And so it makes, um, so that's what he tries to do. I also think it's important that we have to understand, like from the other point of view, if you're someone that someone is coming to you and confiding you and things like that, you have to also not be judgmental or in a sense like look at them like, for real, that's what you've been doing <laughs> or things like that, you know? You really have to use discretion too yeah. with that on that side because for someone to even come, I think it's a blessing in a sense for someone to come to you and confide in you and things like that. And sometimes I've realized that most of the time when people come to me and they tell me like, okay, this is what I'm struggling with. It's something I've been doing too, or like it has happened to me. So I'm able to like advise them, but I just don't go to them like, girl, for real, that's what you've been doing. <laughs> I did not know yeah. you were that type of person, you know, yeah. like you have to be able to be understanding and not just like, you know, very judgmental to them. That's so. a really good point, because I think that's why, um, even Galatians 6.1, like we are talking about, we just have to restore one another in the spirit of meekness. Mm -hmm. And like, even if you didn't go through that particular problem, you still have to be humble enough lest you make the same mistake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's like, a lot of times that's why people don't even open up to like, people yeah. like, they say Christians are judgmental and things like that. It's because like, a lot of times, maybe that's our initial reaction like, oh, bro, really? Come on, like, pick yourself yeah. up, do, mm -hmm. do better. But, I mean, for someone to come up to you and, like, open up that part of their life to you, um, it, it's, like, it takes a lot of humility to do yeah. that. And it takes a lot of, like, vulnerability, like we're saying. And it's not easy. It takes a lot of yeah, strength easy, yeah. to come up and say, yeah. like, look, I need help with this. Like, help mm -hmm. me out. And it's up to us to have that love of God 
and help people match up their lives. Because a lot of people don't know how to act in church. Like, they just want to keep going. That's why they're even there in the first place. Or they want to keep coming, but they know that their life is not matching up. So they just need time and love to keep growing to be the um, person that God wants them to be. So I think that's important. Yeah, and I think we can, like, even pray like that God will help give us understanding and just to have a compassionate heart towards others like even though you may not understand how that person could be going through mm -hmm. you can be like Lord help me like to see that these people need me and to say the right things and that will help them and to not come off across as judgmental and like shut them off completely. And you said earlier that, you know, it's important that when we confess to people or we go to people for help, that we go to our leaders and we go to our pastors. And I think that it's very important. And even I'll use myself as, as an example. I remember um, when I first came to um, inside the church and I was like really going through like different things, asking questions about um asking questions um, about God, about different things, and also trying to overcome certain things in my past, like overcoming, like being um, not necessarily bitter, but unforgiving, like how to overcome these like little, little things like that. And I remember there was somebody who was in the church, who was uh, my spiritual mother, and she was in the church. And one of the things that led me to go to her was that I felt that she was trustworthy. And I also mm -hmm. felt as though she was spiritually mature. And she also wasn't somebody that like gossip, like, okay, have you heard Andrea mm -hmm. told me this, you know? And then she <laughs> and like, was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and so. <laughs> yeah, so she she wasn't a person like that, and I realized that I could go to her and I could confide in her, and she was able to help me to deal with the things that I was going through and counsel me and point me to the direction and say, you know, the Word of God says this, this is how you do this, you know, pray, ask God to help you to be delivered from these issues, ask God to help you to be changed and stuff, and then I was like, wow, you know, God can actually help me with all these things, but I would have never known if I didn't go to somebody and say that, what does the Bible say about Forgiving. What does the Bible say about um, being unequally yoked? What does the Bible say about like not being in the world? And she was able to point me in the direction of where to go. So I that's important. Point. And that's why I forgot to study to show that I self approved. Because, mm. I mean, you can, what if someone comes to you and you just give them your own advice? Yeah. Nah, I mean, there was <laughs> a verse true, I was yeah. reading, there was a verse I was reading recently, and it's like, do not rely on your own wisdom or mm. do not rely on your own way of thinking. Like sometimes someone will come to your private problem and they'll come to you and open up to you, but you tell them a the completely wrong thing that's not even biblical. That's like true. things like that. You need to be careful about the advice that you give to people. Mm -hmm. Like someone might say like, oh, I'm struggling with this. And they'll be like, oh no, just get a, like a 20 inch weave and everything will be okay. What? Like, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, bro. I mean, I'm serious. Like, wow. or something like that. What oh, nah, you advice. need self-confidence. Like don't yeah. let anybody tell you anything. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, wow. you gotta like yeah. be careful. Like, cause I mean, there's a lot of like secular advice that you just see around and you might think that, oh yeah, this is sound valuable, <laughs> this is powerful, but it's not really going to even change yeah. much about them. They're just going to find themselves in the same place and you don't want to be responsible for someone. That's why you have to like be ready in and out. If you find yourself someone, if you don't even have to be a leader. Your friend mm -hmm. could come to you and you just got to know like what to say and, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit can also help you and teach you what to say in that moment. So. If you just tuned into the First Love TV show, we've been talking about being publicly strong but um, being weak in the private. And we said that it is important that you deal with the things in the private, whatever um, issues or whatever sins that you're dealing with, it's important that you seek the face of God to be able to be delivered from these things. We also said another way to be able to get deliverance is by confessing your sins to one another. We said that it's important to find somebody who's trustworthy, somebody who's mature, somebody who will be able to help you to overcome these sins so that you'll be able to have a better fellowship with God, so that you'll be able to relate with God. And we're going to take a short break and continue this discussion. Hi guys, my name is Francisca and welcome back to the first level. What up y'all? to the First Love TV show. We've been talking about why it's important to be not only publicly strong, but also important to be privately strong. And we're going to be looking at this scripture, which Jeremy gave earlier some more, which I believe was in Luke 8, 17. And it was basically saying that we must be aware of the things that we are doing in private and secret. And I believe that this scripture also has another thing, or we can shed light on the scripture some more. So Jeremy, I want yeah, you I mean to... Most people feel like that scripture is just like a 
condemnation verse, like, oh, whatever you do in the secret, bro, it's going to come out. <laughs> like, but I mean, that means, like, also the good things that you do in the secret, the secret life that you are living when nobody's watching, the fruits of that will also come out. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, I think the, the number one way to be able to overcome having a weak private life is change what you do in private, mm -hmm. basically. I mean, like, if you know that you're, you're struggling to be publicly strong or you're struggling in that private life, I think that finding ways to do things in the secret, like pray in the secret or things like that, get closer to God in those behind closed doors where nobody's watching, that leads to the manifestation of things that, I mean, it will always come to light. It yeah. will always come to light. There will always be evident to everyone that, look, what you're doing in the secret, it, it will always come out. Even though no one's watching what you're doing, God sees that and it will always come to light. Yeah, and even with what um, you're saying, like even doing certain things in the secret will help you with some of the things that you're struggling with. If you take something like um, what we will say, quiet time in which you spend time with God. Let's say you wake up in the morning and you get your Bible, you get a pen and or pencil or your tablet. And <laughs> because some people don't have tablets. Um, and Shade? <laughs> and then... Um, and then you go into, his, uh, into your corner and then you're reading your word and you're spending time with God and you're reading the scriptures and you're asking God, okay, Lord, how can I deal with this issue? Or you're asking God, reveal the scripture to me in a different light. You begin to realize that even as you're spending time with God, as Jeremy was saying, the things that you're doing in the secret will actually bear fruit. So as you're doing your quiet time, as you're getting deeper into the word, as you're reading your word, as you're even spending time with God, you'll begin to see that those even sins that you're dealing with will naturally and gradually begin to fall off because you begin reading your word and you see a scripture that says, hmm, God doesn't like liars. And you'd be like, okay, what does it mean by lying? Is a white lie a lie? <laughs> is, um, How is you know, a exaggerating lie? <laughs> a lie? And you'll begin to see like these different things and it'll be able to help you and you'll be able to shed light. So I think that it's important that we take things such as doing our quiet time and other things that we do in the secret. We should spend more time on that and our energy on those things because we can see the fruits of it over I, time. I think, I think in an unpopular opinion that I have <laughs> is that you should, I don't think we should focus on our, our fixing our problems as much, as much as we should focus on spending time with God. Yeah. I feel like the more time you spend in the presence of God and the more that you, f you do things when nobody's watching, that will lead to the changes in your life. Okay. But most people say, I have to fix this. Like, I have to fix mm. this part about me. Yeah. Like, if I don't fix this, then I'm, God doesn't see me. But the reality is, first of all, God knows your frame. Number two, he knows the mistakes that you make. Like, he knows that you're going to make the mistake. He even knows the mistake you're going to make 24 hours from now. Like, and even you, before you make it. Yeah, like you make it. So why would you spend so much time trying to fix that particular mistake when all God really wants is that fellowship? And you realize that the things that you're struggling with, they begin to dry off of you. And that's what happened to me. Like, that's my testimony because wow. I didn't focus. The things that I realized that I, I might be struggling with, I never made it my attention to, oh, I'm going to fix this. Mm -hmm. I just try to change what I did in private. So, like, when you change what you do in private, like, oh, I wasn't reading my word in private, so now I'm going to try to do that. Or I wasn't praying enough in the secret place, so maybe I should just try prayer or listening to messages yeah. or things like that. And as I continue to do that, then, like the scripture says, it comes to light. So that began to take over my life, and then all of a sudden, the things that I struggled with began to just drop off. Like, I never made it my plan to try and say, no, I'm going to change, because you can't change yourself. Yeah. That's what most Christians don't realize, so... Mm. Even when you, like, let's say you take, for example, um, Moses in the Bible, you see that um, you, God calls him, he goes up to a mount, and you see that he has a tablet in which he writes the Ten Commandments, and you see that it's a, a tablet. tablet. <laughs> <laughs> like a they stone tablet. tablet. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Not <laughs> a stone. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, so he goes up, and you realize that when he comes down, well, he stays up there for a long time. You realize when he comes down, he has written, you know, the things that God has told him on the tablet. And people see this glory and this presence around him. And I, in relation to your point, Jeremy, like how you said that, you know, we shouldn't try to fix our own problems. People think that, okay, if I just, sometimes people even try to fix their problems by sometimes drinking or finding peace or pleasure in other people, but they don't realize that, it's by seeking God first that you will um, be able to deal with these issues and the problems that you're going through. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, and I think um, 
one other like aspect of like duality that we may see in our Christian lives is like being spiritual versus being carnal. And I think that whenever we focus on the things of the world, it's hard to focus on the things of the, of the spiritual world. And what I mean by that is like, when you're focused on carnal things, those are like completely opposite to spiritual things, like how you feel mm. or um, yeah, like your mood, those things like define what you do. And I think that that is something that Christians, we have to be wary of because in this world we're bombarded with like focusing on how we feel, on what we feel like doing. And if you go along with that mentality, it's impossible for you to also carry out a mentality where God is leading you. Yeah, Romans 8, 5, I was reading this earlier, and it's funny that you bring that up because it says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what mm. the flesh desires. Mm. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Mm -hmm. So if you're, when you're carnally minded, you focus on what your flesh desires. So anytime you see somebody who's carnally minded, they do what their flesh wants. Like, the body. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. you're trying to yeah. see what your flesh desires. So if you're looking for, a lot of times, what I know is like all young people, they try to find different ways to have fun because they're trying to find what what, their, what, what pleases the flesh. Yeah. So every time it's like there's something different, whether it's mm -hmm. like smoking weed or like going out longer or staying out later <laughs> or, do, or going to this city. Some people drive like three hours mm -hmm. just to go to 6th Street or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> what is 6th Street? Downtown. Downtown, I don't downtown know. Austin. Like, oh, like okay. I mean, they, they take a like journeys. Oh my God, I haven't been there. Mary, how do you know? Mary, I've been in Austin. Everybody talks about it. Okay. That better be the reason. Yeah, I mean. Because they're just trying to find what their flesh is. And that's what their mind is. It's like if you're calling minded, that's what your mind is set on. Mm -hmm. What can I do to please my flesh today? Like basically, oh, I'm going to sleep because I feel tired. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to eat this because I, like, I feel like eating. Cisco, did I hate you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. <laughs> I mean, okay. that's what it means. But you can't be, but to sp be spiritually minded. When you're spiritually minded, your mind is set on what your spirit desires. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of a sudden, you're like, okay, I haven't prayed today. I feel like I need to pray. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't read my word today. I feel like I need to read my word. So it's like, it's all based on like, what are you trying to fulfill? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to fulfill the desire of your flesh? Or are you trying to fulfill the desire of your spirit? And I think that's what Mary's saying. That we should have to like, be spiritually aligned and not carnal. Yeah, and if you read um, the next verse, I think it is um, Romans 8, verse 6. It says, but to be spiritually minded... But to be spiritually minded, carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. So from what you're saying, Jeremy, like, if we think about it, if we're living with our carnal mind, the the cause of it is our, uh, our downfall. And yeah. if you're spiritually minded, there's, when your spirit is open, that's, basically when your spirit is open, that's what opens you to the relationship with the God, um, that factor. But when you're carnally minded, all you think about is what pleases your flesh, what makes your flesh feel feel good and young people we tend to really really I feel like we really really focus on our fleshly desires because I don't know I feel like at this age that's all we think about we don't yeah. really think about following yeah. the things of God or what God has to say about what we're doing we don't think about the yeah. relationship aspect of being with God we tend to focus more on like what our body wants and I'm guilty because I love to eat. So <laughs> no, I sometimes tend to, yes, I sometimes <laughs> tend to. But we have to understand that to be spiritually minded and the cause, um, the things that happen when we are spiritually minded. Yeah, and if what, you don't oh, I'm sorry. mind me reading what you had said in Romans 8, 6 to 10, it says, for the mind, for the mind set on the flesh is death. Mm -hmm. But the mindset on the flesh is life and peace. On the flesh? On the spirit. On the spirit. Sorry, on the spirit is life and peace. Peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Mm -hmm. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Amen. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that that just even goes to what we have been saying, that you know you cannot be um, carnally minded and also have a specific or type of relationship so with God. does that mean you shouldn't sleep when you want to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, of like, course. Because like, oh, don't please your flesh. Or like, cause I'm, and then some people are like, oh, well, that doesn't make sense because it's like, 
what if I'm hungry and I want to eat? Or like, I mean, what if I'm no, but too there's, much. It's yeah, more it's like too much. too much of something is like bad for yeah. you. Like when I you think have there's a time and a place for everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're sleeping 12 hours a day, like why are you sleeping all that time? Like what time would you even have to even go to work to try to pray, <laughs> to try to pray, to do your like quiet time, uh, to even study, to be able to do things. So I think that we shouldn't do things in, in excess. excess yeah. And we shouldn't also be slothful. So how do we, I mean, I mean, my question for me, I mean, if, if I'm struggling with the flesh, <laughs> What's right? your question? Yeah. If I'm struggling with the flesh, like how do I, I become it. spirit controlled? Like, let's say I know that my flesh is dominating me. Like, but then that's also when you follow what the spirit of, the fruit of the spirit has to offer for you. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, in a sense, when you tend to focus on that, that's a sense. Because all those fruits are spirits. So for you to be spiritually minded, you're following what the spirit has to offer. So yeah. I think that's a... I think another interesting point to answer my own question <laughs> is, is that... <laughs> The verse said the mindset on the flesh, the mindset on the flesh is like, it's, it's what, it, so your mind, I think that has to do a lot with what mm -hmm. you're thinking about. Yeah. Sure. What do you, what do you focus on pleasing? Yeah, what do you, like, what do you focus on pleasing? I mean, priorities? to be practical, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, to be spiritually minded, no spirit is going to come in you and be like, oh, sure. shoot, I just want to pray. Like, no. <laughs> but like, what is your mind set on? Like, mm -hmm. change what your mind is set on. Even though you might feel like, dang, I really want to, yeah. I don't know, go to this eat. party right now, or uh, eat, or whatever. Not to say don't my spirit is yeah. something else. Yeah. So my mind is set on praying, because I know that's what my spirit wants. Yeah. My mind is set on reading my word. Whatever you feel like your spirit needs or to get closer to God, that's what your spirit is yearning for. And the more that you set your mind on those things, you become, that's what governs you. That's what yeah. controls you. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, you put your flesh, because the flesh is always something you have to carry around, uh, but the spirit the is something that we have to be led by. And mm -hmm. I think people try to be like spooky and they're like, okay, well, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, serious. I'm like, they try to be spooky and it's like, what is this spirit? What do you mean by set your mind? But like, when you're going to work, does somebody have to come to your room and knock your door and say, okay, please, you have to wake up, you have to go to work, you have to go to school? No, you have a mindset that if I don't go to work, I'm not going to get paid. If I don't go to school, I'm not going to graduate and find a job. And the mm -hmm. same thing, it comes to spiritual things. Mm -hmm. You have to have a mindset. If I don't wake up and pray, That's my right. spiritual life is going to be yeah. lacking. You enter you and make you wake yeah. up. Like, yeah. you got to, like, make the sacrifice. Or any angel will come to your room yeah. and just yeah. whisper to you. So as you yeah. do that, you feed your spirit, and then all of a sudden, that what starts to lead you. That's and it becomes the, more awakened. Yeah, 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 things like that. Marion, were you going to say something? I, think I was going to say, in, in regards to Franny's verse that she read, um, when she said, to be carnally minded is death, mm -hmm. um, I think, to me personally, that means, like, all the things that you do related to your flesh all end up in nothing. Like, they Ooh, all end wow. up not getting you anywhere. But when you focus on things that are spiritual, they have eternal benefits. But, like, for your flesh, you're hungry, you eat the next... Hour, you're hungry again, <laughs> <laughs> depending on who you are. Poop it out. Okay. Or like anything, when you try to gratify your flesh, it's, you're never gonna be satisfied. All of that just ends up to you wanting more, and ultimately just death. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I want to. If you just tuned into the First Love TV show, we've been talking about the importance of developing a relationship with God. We've been talking about the importance of spending time with God. We also said that it's important that you fix your mind on God, you fix your mind on the things of God, because when you don't fix your mind on the things of God and you start focusing on the things in the world, those things will easily come and take you away from Christ. And with that, we will see you again next week. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching the First Love TV show. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back next week Wednesday at 7 p.m. CST. If you're a French speaker, we invite you to attend our first service, which begins at 9 a.m. Our second service starts promptly at 11 a.m., which is in English. If we have found grace, we are located at 7601 West Sam Houston Parkway South, Houston, Texas, 77036. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive alerts for our services and TV shows. Have a blessed and fruitful week.